Hello and welcome everyone to the 5G Factor. I'm Ron Westfall, Research Director here at the Futurum Group, and I'm joined here today by my distinguished colleague, Todd Weiss, our team analyst for matters related to communication networks, for instance. And today we're going to dive into our show called the 5G Factor, which is all about the 5G ecosystem and the IoT and the major developments that have caught our eye. So Todd, welcome back to the 5G Factor and thank you for joining today. Uh, what have you been doing between the episodes? How have you been bearing up? Oh, I'm just studying, Ron, so that I can help you and work with you on these. This is a great, a great feature. I'm really enjoying working with you on these. Well, wonderful. Thank you for the uh, shout out there, Todd. And with that, let's queue up. Now, uh, recently, the Fiber Connect 2023 event uh, concluded in Orlando. And uh, I think there was a, several major takeaways from the event. And that is uh, fiber plays an essential role in how 5G is built out and how it will evolve not only today, but certainly over uh, the next uh, two years plus into the foreseeable future, quite simply. And so the question is, why is fiber so essential to 5G? As a little background, fiber optic technology has long been used in long haul networks. And due to its high performance capabilities over long distances, fiber can travel as far as 40 miles without losing signal strength. So this is remarkably an improvement over, for example, copper technologies. Oh yeah, it's a huge, it's a huge benefit. That's why we're seeing it in neighborhoods being spread out all over. That, we see them in the neighborhoods everywhere. Well, right on. I think people will build and install fiber wherever possible. Uh, and so that's you know basically some of the background here. But in addition, it's also about 5G wireless small cells and how they're interrelated with the fiber network. And to better understand it, uh, we can look at it in physiological terms. That is, 5G functions are basically the capillaries of an overall wireless network. And what I mean by that is, again, the small cells that are distributed throughout a city uh, will basically uh, onboard the traffic to the fiber backbone, to uh, basically uh, the traffic that is uh, the, the veins and arteries, if you will, of uh, the overall journey of that traffic. And Great analogy. Further... Great analogy. Yeah, right <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Todd. And, and to further contextualize it, according to a study by Deloitte, only 11% of overall traffic is actually carried on the wireless uh, network. But uh, the remaining 89% is transported across the wireline network. And so you can see why, you know, right away, why fiber is so essential to, you know, 5G success. In fact, uh, Delight also anticipates that $150 billion in investment will be need needed in fiber infrastructure alone to ensure that, you know, 5G networks are deployed properly, but more importantly, are optimized to handle, you know, the uh, traffic demands and all the other applications that will onboard, particularly as operators code over to 5G standalone. And, and of course, so, that, that, that figure is going to rise. Oh, yeah. No, I, I think that that's definitely a snapshot. And yes, as we discussed previously, the operators are dialing back, at least in the U.S., the major ones, some of their CapEx, uh, uh, the remainder of this year and also to 2024. Right. However, that does not deny that that investment will again rise further out in the future. But also a lot of fundamental work needs to be done to really get the 5G networks you know, ready you know, for prime time. Yeah. And uh, at that uh, event, uh, Nokia, I believe, stood out. Uh, for example, uh, Nokia demonstrated that it's compliant with BABA, that is Buy America, Build America uh, requirements, that when Congress passed you know, some of the recent funding bills for digital demand uh, reduction, for example, to, that is looking at ways to meet underserved or uh, unserved uh, markets with broadband builds. And so definitely they're interested in having uh, products that are built in the U.S. to meet you know, these U.S. broadband demands. So that's only natural. But in addition to that, uh, Nokia introduced a 25G PON starter kit that's aimed at 10 gig plus service opportunities. Uh, also, they unveiled its Cortica home connectivity software aimed at monetizing and improving the overall broadband experience. And this is particularly relevant, uh, for, for example, to hybrid workforce environments. 
now that more and more people are working from home, clearly the organizations need to have, you know, not only high speed connections to the home that uh, is now part of the, uh, their workforce, but also have security assurance and so forth built in. And this is where fiber can make a huge difference. Also, uh, they expanded their network in a box program and also strengthened their existing manufacturing presence in the U.S. Uh, through uh, deals with Sanmina in Wisconsin, as well as Fabernet in California. And so that's a lot right there. But in addition to that, Todd, what do you see Nokia doing to really up their fiber game when it comes to 5G builds? Well, that's those are great points. But Nokia in Vodafone began in 2021 to trial PON technology, passive optical network. Um, this delivers record speeds of up to 100 gigabytes a, gigabits a second on a single PON wavelength. This is 40 times faster than widely deployed gigabit PON technology and 10 times faster than the most widely advanced fiber networks in operation today. That's a giant jump. That's a giant performance jump. So this trial, to, to me, shows that there are no limits to fiber networks. The, the amount of performance that we're going to get out of these, I don't think there's any limit to it. It's just going to keep getting more uh, better and faster. Their huge capacity, oh, yeah. yeah, their huge capacity potential and wide availability can transform fiber into a unifying infrastructure that connects everything, consumers, businesses, smart cities, 5G cells, and more. And one of the things that we don't talk about that much is how fiber can bring service to places that aren't getting service, rural areas, uh, you know, remote areas. I think that fiber could be the answer in these places. Finally, we've been looking for this for what, two decades, a decade. So I think this is a big deal. Oh, I, I agree unequivocally. Can you say future proof? Because as you can see right now, the industry in the U.S. at least is certainly focused on, for example, 25G pond. But knowing that there is 100G pond capabilities further out, definitely, I think, gives more confidence in investing in you know, the PON infrastructure that is quite simply essential to yeah. you know, the ability of 5G to serve you know, these uh, difficult to reach areas. And uh, this is all, I think, uh, coming together more. I think, again, to your point, the bead funding uh, that Congress authorized will help drive uh, some of this, certainly over the next uh, a few years. I, I, I agree accordingly. Yeah, and, 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 this was, and this is a standard. I mean, there's so many other disparate systems. Every provider wants to work on fiber. So this is like a unifying theme that's going to make it finally happen, I think. I, I don't think that's unreasonable to think that. Sure. No, I, I, I think that's an excellent point. It's uh, the flexibility of fiber. At least some of these fiber platforms can handle multiple capabilities on a single unit or a single platform that includes certainly 5G small cell backhaul, but in addition to you know business to business connections and a host of other you know uh, requirements. And I I see that uh, not only is Nokia putting its hat into the ring here, but at the Fiber Connect event, I saw Sienna come out with some I think interesting uh, capabilities. And to be specific, uh, Sienna is continuing to develop its X Hall portfolio to meet what I think are some very stringent timing and synchronized synchronization requirements in the fiber backhaul network. Uh, as a little more background, 5G systems uh, require accuracy and frequency, phase, and time synchronization to quite simply optimize RAN performance. As a result, uh, we're seeing operators are now looking at more and more ways to leverage network timing distribution across their transport infrastructure to complement, for example, local global navigation satellite system or GNSS at cell sites. And that quite simply yields a more robust RAN architecture. Yeah, yeah, and absolutely. As, uh, yes, and as such, Todd, the accuracy and resilience challenges are further spiced by the need to, of course, minimize uh, costs and investments. And so uh, that is compounded by the fact that you know, every operator out there uh, with maybe a few greenfield exceptions had to deal with legacy, non-time aware third party network segments and also uh, the ability to uh, really integrate this into a fully managed view. And so that clearly is a challenge. And how Santa is responding to that is, I think, uh, very insightful and very important. Uh, for example, at their R&D labs in Ottawa, uh, we see Sienna showcasing X-Hall portfolio advancements 
And this is, I think, uh, again, uh, meeting that timing and synchronization priority that operators are definitely very keen on. They're very hot on. And uh, as such, uh, Sienna is demonstrating a streamlined approach to deploying and managing time and distribution across a 5G network. And this includes G.8275.1 and G.8275.2 interworking capabilities, as well as assisted partial timing support. And uh, to top it all off, Sienna has submitted pre-standard assisted full timing support failover schemes. And that, I think, can put operators in a better position to quite simply make their advanced timing capabilities all the more ready for you know, 5G prime time, especially, again, as 5G cuts over to standalone capabilities and just a little further out, adopt 5G advanced capabilities. And uh, I think to round out my observation here, key to advancing these XL capabilities is assuring that the operators have an easy way to visualize all this. And this is where Santa's MCP, that is the domain controller, allows them to be able to uh, implement multi-layer network management. And so with that, Todd, uh, what else do you see uh, that Santa is doing that is really you know, standing out? Well, those are great points. But the other thing I think is really a big deal is their flexibility. The flexibility mm -hmm. to adapt and support the RAN evolution is a key design driver. Without flexibility, this is not going to grow. Be, to be able to have uh, service providers be able to do whatever they need to do, wherever they need to do it, with anything they need to do is huge. That's the thing that will help this grow to become something that just is, is uh, a huge uh, an even more... That is, that is something that will help this grow to be absolutely everywhere around the world. Um, I think the transport flexibility continues to be top of mind for mobile operators. It's absolutely necessary. It's absolutely critical. Transport network's ability to adapt to new requirements, and they're coming, they're always going to come, um, and thus enable RAN evolution is seen as critical in the search for better performance at lower costs. Operators are especially looking for high 10 gigabit Ethernet or up to 25 gigabit Ethernet port densities to accommodate new spectrum introduction all in compact and energy efficient platforms that minimize power and space in dense cell site environments. This is going to, it's like, it's like transistors. It's going to get smaller and smaller and denser and denser. That's the way technology works, even here. Um, slicing readiness is also mentioned as critical to pave the way to future end-to-end -end slicing deployments. Making slicing easier, better is going to be a huge thing. Um, and then openness of transport platforms and versatility to support any combination of front haul, mid haul, back haul, and preferably the ability to converge even non-mobile traffic in the same router. Those are things that are also factors being identified by many as highly valuable to future-proof their transport designs. This is a big deal. So Sienna's X haul portfolio, it's positioned solidly to accelerate operator ran evolution. This is this is a a time we're going to remember. We're going to look back at this, I think, and mark when this change happened. And I think it's it's going to be very influential. Oh, I, I agree wholeheartedly, Todd. I think you brought out two excellent points. For example, slicing readiness. Uh, T Mobile CTO John Saul has come out and said, "We're ready." Let's do this, you know, because we've been talking about it for a while. And so this, I think, is a true execution point. That is, here is a milestone in the industry that a major U.S. operator is ready to do this slicing uh, readiness. And also, I th what I really like is your point about open access networks. I think we're getting closer, at least in the U.S., and this has already been implemented in you know, many parts of Europe, is that uh, different operators will compete to use the same network to offer services to you know, customers out there. And that, you know, of course, is healthy for competition. And uh, we have the same kind of thing here in Texas when it comes to energy, uh, for example. So why not, you know, broadband services? So this is, I think, coming together more. And you know, these are you know, clearly demonstrating that companies like Nokia and Sienna are definitely helping advance 5G network capabilities nationwide. And with that in mind, Calix mobile backhaul solutions, I think, are definitely meeting uh, many of these very top demands. For example, we know small cells are proliferating out of necessity. Traffic is growing you know, dramatically. And uh, again, that competition is intensifying in terms of winning 
know, those 5G service dollars. Oh, yeah. And to meet these change requirements, I think the networks quite simply have to always be on. Uh, they have to provide that unprecedented visibility and also quite simply deploy quickly. You know, we, we can't, you know, have these 12 month deployment cycles oh, from, yeah. you know, the past. And uh, so with that in mind, I think what Calix is doing with this solutions is really meeting some of these key requirements, let alone uh, pain points. Uh, as we know, hundreds or thousands of smartphones depend on the connection to the base station. And this is where you know, the mobile backhauler, the mobile uh, providers use backhaul capabilities to ensure you know, the overall service qualities. In fact, uh, now we know that mobile operators require real-time visibility into how the circuit is performing. And this also includes bandwidth on demand. And that also means that the circuit can never fail quite simply. And as a result, what we're seeing is that the uh, service providers are planning to use uh, E5308 and the E5520 products by Calix, along with their existing equipment to collect uh, Y1731 reports and also use that in combination with Calix's service verify uh, capabilities. Again, that full time visibility uh, that also uses predictive analytics to alert them when they're you know, approaching all important service level agreement thresholds, as well as you know, ensuring the overall integrity of Calix's mobile backhaul portfolio. And so with that in mind, uh, Todd, from your perspective, what else do you see from the Calix mobile backhaul portfolio that is exemplary? Funny you should ask. Um, the <laughs> Calix, Calix has some products that are absolutely going to help in this area. The Calix Axos E5 Ethernet service access nodes they integrate carrier Ethernet 10G and 1G uni service demarcation and Ethernet aggregation capabilities to deliver premium service and backhaul, mobile backhaul services with operational efficiency and service assurance. These are doing the hard work and making it look easy. Designed for the demanding business services market, the E5500 and the E5300 products deliver more services to more subscribers, enabling the fastest time to revenue. And for service providers, this is exactly what they need and want. Um, for high-speed internet, for dedicated internet access, metro ethernet private lines, ethernet LAN, power over ethernet, precision timing, and more, whatever they need, these products will deliver it, which is just a huge thing for service providers. They're all looking for the competitive edge over the others. And so bringing in this kind of equipment is gonna help them. Whatever their customers call for, the Axos E5 business products can exceed their expectations. I, I really do think, Ron, these are going to help make a, a lot of improvements in the industry. I really do. I agree wholeheartedly again. And I think uh, what's also important to note that Calix isn't resting on its laurels. Uh, for example, they recently worked with Allo Communications to sustain uh, to have a secure sustainability funding for uh, that all important uh, service provider uh, partner. So it's not just uh, only about, you know, ensuring the integrity of the overall 5G network, as well as the overall fiber network, but also fulfilling society wide uh, objectives, such as advancing sustainability goals, uh, improving uh, the energy efficiency, and thus, you know, helping the overall environment. So this is all coming together. This is something that, again, is having impact on all of us and not just quite simply, you know, what the service providers are requiring in order to even be uh, have uh, Calix's technology considered in uh, the evaluation phases. And with that positive note, Todd, thank you so much again for joining uh, the 5G Factor. Uh, any concluding thoughts? No, just thanks for having me again. I enjoy working with you and doing these. It's always a good discussion, Ron. Uh, you bet. And uh, to our viewing audience, thank you so much for taking time to join our webcast. And with that, we look forward to seeing you on our next 5G Factor and have a great 5G day, everyone. Thank you. See you later. <laughs>